Hello everybody and welcome to this panel session, Opening the International Production Floodgates. Uh, I'm Chris Evans, the Locations Editor for KFTV, Screen International and World of Locations. Uh, today we have gathered some leading experts to discuss the new production landscape, how things will be different on set, lessons learned from these difficult times, and the key talking points for producers. Uh, during our chat, feel free to post your questions for the panelists, and I will try to get to as many of them as possible at the end of this session. Uh, right, let me introduce you to our panelists. We have Mike Fantasia, uh, president of the Location Managers Guild International. Uh, Mike is a vastly experienced location manager and production supervisor who has worked on over 30 major films, including Top Gun Maverick, The Amazing Spider-Man, Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, and Godzilla. Uh, we also have Sam Breckman, who is a veteran line producer and unit production manager, whose list of credits include His Dark Materials, uh, Tomb Raider, Born 5, Game of Thrones, and Captain America First Avenger. He's worked with several major companies including Netflix, Bad Wolf, MGM, and Legendary Entertainment. Uh, we also have uh, Georgette Turner, who has worked as a UPM and location manager for 15 years on big projects including Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them, and Wonder Woman. Currently, she is in-house director for production safety uh, for US studio Boat Rocker and recently worked as COVID UPM for the 93rd Academy Awards. Georgette will be joining us shortly. Uh, finally, we have Mike Day, CEO of Palmer Pictures, one of the world's leading production service companies based at its studio complex in Mallorca and in Barcelona. Mike has worked his way through pretty much every position in the industry from runner to assistant director. His recent list of credits with Palmer Pictures include the hugely popular Netflix series, The Crown and White Lines. So let's kick off with some questions. Let's start with what, what do you make of the current production landscape? I and mean, obviously there are several film and TV projects now shooting around the world, especially in hotspots like Hungary and the Czech Republic, but there are also countries noticeably suffering still. Are the floodgates likely to burst open in the coming months? Uh, Mike Fantasia, do you want to kick us off on that? Sure, just one slight correction. I am no longer the president of Location Managers Guild International. I, we just had a, our election and I stepped down after three years. So I'm, I'm two days shy of, uh, of that. Um, you know, from what I'm hearing and what I'm seeing, um, now that there's a lot of pent up production, I mean, even though it seems like a lot of places are very, very busy, there's still a lot of production that hasn't cranked up. I think with the U.S. and a lot of other nations uh, uh, easing their restrictions, I think we are going to see the floodgates open. Um, I've had uh, three or four calls in the last couple of weeks for uh, projects both in the U.S. and one internationally. And they're just waiting for numbers to get just a little bit better. And uh, they're ready to launch. Uh, Mike, other Mike, do you want to come in there as well in terms of the situation in Spain? Yeah, thanks, Chris. <clears throat> thanks for having having us on the panel. Um, I believe the same as Mike, actually. Uh, we're seeing um, after a, a, a tough 2020 and a, and a, a slower start to 2021, uh, we're seeing um, uh, probably soft prep on, on productions into the summer and into the fall. We're already actively working on, on a couple of shows and expect more to come through this year and really for 2021 we see it as a as a bounce back year rebound year we see this as a recovery year really from our perspective in 2021 as a as a rebound year it's fair to say that our our pipeline of work is probably fuller now than than it ever has been kind of covid aside i was going to say so to the same extent as pre-covid um do you think there's going to be a huge onrush of production shooting all over the world or is there going to be sort of slight restraint bearing in mind the current environment. Sam, do you want to come in there? Uh, well, it's interesting. Uh, we also, uh, here we have the added uh, hurdle of Brexit, uh, making uh, travel abroad difficult in certain circumstances. So whilst there's a huge, uh, huge demand for high-end television features, uh, normal television, uh, the I've had a couple of shows that have gone down because they've been trying to do English and foreign locations. Now, as soon as we sort out the whole visa side of it and then tying that in with COVID, we hope relaxing or certainly some of the protocols, it will be interesting to see how the studios or how people cope with how COVID is then dealt with in the next six months. Are we, are we still going to be into the protocols we have? Are they going to be more relaxed? Are people going to be more uh, 
uh, um, able to accommodate what we're constantly where with the constantly changing and evolving rules so i think at the moment in britain it is it is bonkers trying to get crew is next to impossible because most people have already been signed up and they're now being signed up to six to eight months in advance of productions because that's what you need to do and no longer is there a choice there's like oh who's available right let's take them there's like oh no can we have three or four different people uh, no you can have one and so whilst it's brilliant for our market and our industry we ask i think there will as mike says the floodgates when they do open and everyone's saying let's build more studios let's build more blah 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 it's, yeah great brilliant how are you going to staff them because staffing i think is going to become a huge issue there is a massive demand for content and without the people to make that content i'm slightly concerned that people will turn up in territories and go yeah right we're going to film here because you've got a great rebate and it's all really hunky-dory but you won't have the crew and that's that scares me do you think that's a worldwide thing or is that just mainly in the uk mike fantasia nodding uh, your head there a lot <laughs> uh, it, it seems like everybody i speak with no matter where they are uh new york los angeles atlanta london uh, folks in Paris. I was speaking with some folks up in Iceland the other day. There's, I'm, I'm trying to find uh, an office coordinator. Can't find one anywhere. Uh, it seems like everybody is totally maxed out. And so I agree when the floodgates open, who the heck is going to staff? And, and actually on the film I'm on, we're suffering from it. We have a lot of folks who would never be in the positions that they are in five years ago. They just don't have the experience. Um, and so I just worry, uh, as, as, as other folks have said, I, I just worry about the future because there just aren't the people out there. I'm conscious I want to bring well, in part of the... Yeah. Oh, sorry, go on. Sorry, go ahead. Carry on, Sam. Oh, I was going to say, part of the problem, as Mike's just alluded to, is people are moving too fast. So experience mm. counts. I mean, the dinosaurs that we all are, with all our years of experience, as people come in, one day they're a PA, the next day they're all of a sudden the production secretary. And it's like, well, no, how does that work? How does someone who's earning 500 pounds one week then expect, they say, oh, no, 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 I've been told this is what I can earn as a, as a secretary or whatever. And their, their salary goes up overnight, three, 400 pounds. It just doesn't make sense at the moment. And I think the, the apprenticeships that we used to have, which four, five, six years doing one job before we move on, They've now gone and people come in going, oh, no, yeah, I can be a coordinator. Yeah, 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 no problem, I'll do that. He said, no, you can't. And you will you will be undone. And, and that, yeah, that's a worry. Um, sorry, I'll bring in Georgette here. Hi, Georgette. Uh, welcome. <laughs> We're just discussing the state of play at the moment and the uh, sort of production landscape. Do you want to give me your thoughts in terms of uh, how you see things panning out in the coming months and whether they, the yeah. pockets will open up? I would say just to add on to what the guys are saying, we've had a whole new department invented with the COVID department. And naturally what happened was, you know, these departments are huge. And so they've taken a lot of resources of good production people and a lot of good location folk. And there's been a whole drain on the rest of our um, facilities. But what also is happening around the world, where a lot of our jobs are imposing US US sanctions from the unions, where a lot of us are using SAG and DCA actors um, and directors, and consequently we have to follow quite a rigorous testing regime. And so what we have found is that particularly between the US and the UK, because we have shot in COVID already, we're in a, a bit of a unique situation where I'm getting approached a lot through international shows to go abroad much more than when I was doing lo locations all the time, just because we have such we're almost veterans in working in COVID because of how the US and the UK have been doing it for so long that I, I'm, I'm certainly seeing a huge um, uplift on, you know, visas, what's going to happen in the summer, what shows are shooting internationally and being able to not only just shoot abroad, usually when you shoot in other territories, you're working with a lot of people that haven't done it before and you're training a whole crew. Not only are we training entire crews in areas, when they're in training, entire crews in working on the film set and working in COVID, which is really complex. Um, and so I do feel like the Production Guild just run a, a great training course that I was part of. There really does need to be um, a lot more training internationally about what these policies are and have a bit more to give us a chance, a bit more of a unified approach to 
COVID policies because you can vary from one show to the next. And I think trying to explain that and work in a foreign territory may just be a bit of a push too far. Have they changed and adapted these protocols over the past year or so? It's been a while now, obviously, COVID. Have they changed and will they continue to change, do you think, in the coming months? And will they ease, perhaps? Sam touched on it briefly earlier, but do you think there'll still be really tight restrictions in place for months and months, even years ahead? I, th I think they'll definitely stay the same. They'll stay tight. I work, I've just done the Oscars and I run the COVID for the international, um, uh, the, the European Oscars and the UK Oscars because we couldn't find nominees abroad. And I was working with the company that wrote the return to work and certainly um there's not a view to change anything from the protocols for at least the next you know until the end of june which is what the the extension has just been what we're finding a lot on shows is that our vaccinated uh people are the ones that are testing positive more now than our unvaccinated people and that's because i think you are you know vaccinated people are going taking more risks going to restaurants doing things outside of work and although they're not symptomatic because we are screening for covid we're picking up a lot more um you know vaccinated positives which obviously has a threat to our show because we're running our shows still based on close contacts just for those who don't understand and this is a worldwide thing close contacts is as much a threat to us as people that are actually unwell with covid because what that does is that threatens to stop the filming so of course we don't want people to get ill but we also don't want that destroying our protective bubbles so in the us the cdc have said if you're fully vaccinated after two weeks there's no such thing as a close contact whereas that's not been adopted within the film industry so it will be interesting to see where that goes but also to see how that works in different territories because you're going with local laws and local infection rates. And so that's a, that's a lot to bring to the table. And what I'm finding is that the reason that we are so busy with the US is because at least we have a process mapped out and it's really imperative to start working with our international friends and, and different film companies to really make sure they grasp what's going on with local infection rates and stuff, because it really can dictate where you are and, and where you're going to film. Broadening that out then, in terms of your own experiences recently working on projects uh, in these COVID times, Mike <coughs> Fantasia, perhaps you kick us off. I know you've been working on Martin Scorsese's film, Killer of the Flower Moon. Can you tell me a bit about what that's been like and shooting in Oklahoma? And I, mean, I know you've had troubles with the weather there, so just talk to me a bit about that. Well, as, as, uh, as Georgette alluded to, um, we're not changing our protocols. Um, Apple's protocols are, are st as strict or stricter in some cases than, than the, the recommendations. Uh, we were told when the relaxation happened a few days ago that we're not changing protocols. Uh, many of us are testing three times a week, some two times a week. They don't plan on changing that until at least uh, mid-July, from what I understand. Um, it, it's been interesting filming here because it is an area where there are a lot of people who deny and uh, who are not embracing the, the vaccine. Um, I, I, we, we've been you know, trying to keep our folks out of restaurants and bars, but when you're in small towns with only a couple of restaurants, you don't have, you're staying in a hotel, you can't cook, you don't have a lot of choice. Um, we have gone nine weeks, I believe, nine or 10 weeks without uh, a case, which is, which is good. Um, Everybody is still masking. It's quite challenging, especially when we're surrounded by a lot of folks who, who don't wear masks. Um, uh, as, as far as how it's affected our production, our, we probably have a COVID team of uh, 75 to 100 people. And um, it's, it's, it's pretty strict. I mean, you can't go to a, a set that we're prepping or wrapping without checking in. Uh, you can't, certainly can't go to set without checking in. If you miss a test, you're thrown out of the cycle. It takes you four or five days to get back in. Um, so it's it's been it's been challenging. It's been very challenging. Um, I, I, I think just the, the the biggest thing for me is just the space that I need when we have 500 extras to deal with spacing and COVID protocols and catering and all of that. It's just, I mean, I was, I thought I was prepared for how big it was going to be, but until we really started setting out the tents and, and trying to find base camps, uh, 
it, it, it's really, it's really, heavy. I'm glad I'm filming in a small town with a lot of space. I can't imagine trying to do this in New York City. It's considerably because of COVID to try and make sure everything's in place and ready for, for shooting. Mike, sorry, trying to carry on there. I'm sorry, you cut out. I was just saying that then therefore is the prep time a lot longer? Yeah, we've, uh, it takes us long to do everything. Uh, a simple director scout, uh, you could, you know, do in 20 or 30 minutes now takes twice or three times that amount of time. People come together. Some people are tested. Some people haven't been tested. You've got to get a quick test. We have to wait. Um, prepping a location uh, is just much more difficult. Uh, we added 20 to 30 percent uh, to our prep and, and wrap schedules because of, of COVID. Fewer people uh, in some of the departments because of a lack of staff combined with spacing and things like that. It's hard to, hard to space yourself out when you've got four people trying to put up a wall 15 feet in the air and they've got to help each other. Uh, it's, you know, guys are, and gals are working in the heat and in the cold with masks and gloves and, you know, it's just, everything is just much more difficult. For you too, Georgette, working on the set, obviously trying to advise people on what they should and shouldn't be doing and making sure everything is done correctly according to the protocols. Is that quite a difficult process? Um, I'm finding it working on shows here and in the US. I'm finding it harder in the US just because of the inconsistency from the CDC. Um, you know, when when the government are saying it's fine to go outside and wear no mask, but our protocols are saying you have to wear a mask, it's really hard to convince people. Obviously, that it's part of our employment and it's part of our terms, but it doesn't help when you know we close contact, but the government are not. So it's it's quite um, it's it's quite hard. To constantly do that what we find is that we have to back it up with the science it's, you know I'm, i am a production person working in covid and will get questioned quite rigorously on why we're doing stuff so i work very closely with the epidemiologists and that's another thing that i would say you know working internationally is really really buddy up to your scientists and your virologists epidemiologists health and safety so that you've really got the science behind you because there is a lot of misinformation out there on on how we do things um, and there's a lot of repetition so if you hear the wrong thing and you're you're passing that on that can you know quickly spiral out of control so what we're we're trying to do is just create that formula which is why we've got the return to work and just repeat it often but with that comes huge complications especially if you're in territories that are you know not set up to handle two or three films at a time where normally you would go into an area and hire three or four marquees, as Mark said, you're hiring, you're hiring five or six. So that may mean that the capacity of a hosting country goes from being able to run three films to one because, you know, of the work pools and the teams that you're pulling and the resources that you're pulling. So there really is a lot more prep time needed just to make sure that you've got the resources, uh, the locations, because if, if a country is locked down, the likelihood is that their employees are locked down too, or on furlough or the equivalent, and you can't get into places. So you really need the extra time, but you definitely need the resources. So where, where we're restarting, everybody's going to sense this sort of overinflation because there's a need for content, but there's also a need for double the spaces, double the teams, double, double the resources to, to work in COVID. And Mike Day, do you want to come in there as well in terms of the situation in Spain and, and obviously prepping projects there? What, what's, what's it like? <clears throat> yeah, thanks, Chris. Um, it's been fine, actually. Uh, we've been able to operate um, over the past year, um, you know, to Georgette and, and Mike's points. Uh, there is a national national uh, uh, advisory, which obviously we have to comply by, and that, that shifts and changes uh, uh, on occasion, depending on the on, on the, the, the level of the, of the pandemic within the certain regions of Spain. We also have a company-wide policy, which we established obviously like, like everybody else last spring. Um, and then we look to adapt to the, uh, the incoming policy of our clients. So you know, one of the escort players, one of the studios, the broadcaster, depending on which country they're coming from, they're always slightly different. Uh, so, and, and to, to, to Georgette's point, um, operating in in public spaces with with the general public people have different viewpoints on things and and filmmaking is quite an international endeavor and, and you might have 
heads of department or crew from multiple different countries all coming together uh, to work on a set, all of whom have come from their home territory that have differing rules. Some are locked down, some have to wear masks, some don't have to wear masks, <laughs> you know, so it's all, it, it, it is challenging in that way, but I think it's, it's all about communication. It's all about communication and, and, um, and gentle communication. You know, we, uh, we have a, a wonderful lady in the house who, uh, Debbie, who's our, who her day job is our talent manager. Uh, but actually she's qualified as a COVID super uh, under the first option, the UK scheme. Um, because we're being asked these questions seven days a week, uh, we need to be able to, to, to answer them diligently. It is the first question we're asked. Uh, it used to be, you know, what locations we have available and, and, you know, what is the kind of the pricing point for our services or shooting in Spain or the rebates. Uh, those those still come, but the first question relates to to COVID. But we're navigating. We're navigated. It's a, it's a, it's a difficult landscape to to navigate. But I think film filmmakers generally, the world over, are pretty adaptable um, and, and filled with initiative. And, and it's nice to see stuff uh, gently restarting. We're certainly seeing that ourselves. And extending from that, sort of, what lessons do you feel have been learned from this very difficult past year? Any positives for production to take forward? I mean. The importance of sustainability, ability to work with smaller crews, perhaps, or smaller travel budgets. Sam, do you want to come in there first in terms of lessons learned and positives? I think the positives that we found uh, when we worked on a couple of productions is, you're right, the smaller crews and trying to minimise your footprint. Um, and certainly being very aware of when you go out with large groups of people on the streets, the what the reaction is from your local population, the local residents of where you are. I think you've got to be very uh, aware and um, uh, approach each individual area with uh, kid gloves into it, to some respect. Uh, we managed to succeed uh, in various different areas around London and we, we were worried going out. We were apprehensive because we were right in the middle of it, but we succeeded and we succeeded in moving 135 people around London for 36 days uh, in small spaces. Uh, and we never had one case that, uh, or one second that was lost to COVID. So that's testament to how we ran our uh, system. But that was, as Georgette alluded to, that was when we weren't allowed to go out. So we knew that everyone was going home and they weren't going out. Now I think it's much more difficult because we are allowed and people do want to go out. They do want to start having a new life again. And I think certainly the approach to filmmaking now is a, it's a lot more considered you do, and as mike said we do need more time to set things up we do need more time to discuss things and we do need to communicate more uh, and the, the the days of oh let's just do this tomorrow have gone i think planning is now essential communication sitting and ideally sitting around a table because all these calls are great zooms works to a point but creatively we all work best if we're sitting in a room and you overhear a conversation or you're aware of something that's happening around you and i think that's what a lot of people are missing. And a lot of people have adapted to this, the new world of Zoom. Uh, oh my God, I wish I'd invented Zoom. Um, but, um, a lot, but a lot of people need to be in a space. They need creatively to be in a space. And I think that's the most difficult thing to try and move forward on is getting us all back into a room. But also it proves that, do we need to be in the office 24 seven? And, and I think the answer to that is maybe, you, you know, you're, the new working environment that we've created for ourselves allows us to do two days away and three days in. Doesn't allow us to have as big as footprints in studios with office space. Doesn't allow us uh, to um, operate under the old regime. And one would like to think moving forward, we're saving money, but we're currently not saving money because as George has said, at least 10% plus of your budget is going on COVID. How long yeah, will exactly. that last? Again, who's gonna... I'd like to see it start start winding down because there's going to be a point where we actually start to we have to work with it. We can't constantly work under this because it is stressful mentally and also financially and physically. Mike, yeah, you've been nodding your head quite a lot throughout there. What are your thoughts in terms of uh, lessons learned? You know, sustainability. Um... To me, I'm ordering many more dumpsters to dump garbage than I ever did before. Everything is single use. You know, you you want a fork to eat a salad and you go pick up a prepackaged fork, knife, spoon, napkin, wrapper, salt, pepper, all together. And I only want the fork. 
that all goes to the trash. Um, uh, I'm in a place where they don't really recycle. So everything is going into the hopper. Uh, so, you know, the cost for those, for just the cutlery and catering and craft service and all of that um, is, is huge. The, the amount of trash that we generate is, is incredible. Um, hopefully, once we get past the, the masking, we can sort of figure out what really is sustainable and what isn't sustainable. When can we recycle? When can't we recycle? Um, crew size. Our crew is much larger than any large film I've worked on. Again, by 75 to 100 people for COVID. Um, we're not traveling as much. We bring in more actors in local, uh, from the Oklahoma, Texas area. But still, we do have folks coming in from overseas and, and the whole visa situation and the, the testing situation. You know, somebody might be tested according to the best regulations in the UK, but they don't maybe don't meet the guidelines here in the U S and so the folks have got to get into a whole new testing regime, different kinds of tests, uh, things like that. So it's, I, I, we're all looking for and waiting for the uh, restrictions to ease. Um, and they are easing, but I don't think it's going to affect the project that, that I'm on. Uh, I don't think it's going to change much. Maybe as we get towards the tail end of it, it will, but we have an, a director who's, in his 70s, we have a, uh, a, a, an actor in his 70s. We've got a couple of, uh, of above the liners who are in their mid 70s. So, you know, the whole thing is let's not get the director sick. Let's not get the designer sick. So the, 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 uh, the message from our folks on high is don't let down. Don't go to the dry hollow and have three whiskeys at the end of the day. Go to your crew members. Go to another crew member's house, maybe. Um, and just and that's going to be hard as the weather gets better. It's going to be really warm yeah. here. It's humid. People want to go out and do things, and we just have to keep a lid on it. But is that why your COVID team is so big to make sure that they monitor everything that's happening and who's doing what, where, why, when? Well, we've got you know in, in some cases uh, there's some days when we're in 13 different locations, either prepping, shooting, or wrapping in addition to our construction shop, our set deck shop, and our office. So we basically have a, a check-in, a COVID check-in team at each location. So we're in 13 places plus our shops, we're in 15 or 16 places. So if each check-in team is three people, uh, we've got four different, three or four different places, depending on the day where you can actually get a test because we're spread out in the biggest county in Oklahoma from one, one corner to the next. We've got nurses and testing facilities in, in three or four places every day, and they're constantly shifting. I mean, every day we get a spreadsheet of who's testing tomorrow and where they have to go. And it's 10 pages long. It's a spreadsheet with, you know, with everybody's name and where they have to go. Um, it's, it, two years ago, if you said we'd be doing this, I would have said you were absolutely crazy. You're living in an Orwellian world, which I guess we are. <laughs> we kind of are, yeah, exactly. And Georgia, Mike touched there on, on sustainability as well as another key issue. I know that's something you've done a lot of work on. So perhaps tell me a bit about you know how important that is for projects at the moment. Yeah, it's it's interesting actually because that's a where Mike is and location is obviously particularly quite tricky. But speaking to a lot of our caterers here, they have found that their waste has gone down because of the portion control. So I, I guess it depends how you're running it, but because everything is pre-portioned there's a lot less actual food waste which has been um was been, has been a bonus also there's quite a few shows running here that are not um we don't operate minibuses you know there's a lot of people that are just it's essential crew only that hasn't really taken off yet into big tech recies like it used to so we do a lot of you know driving into the office for a zoom meeting or just all driving to one location or, or get driving to a place to get on a bus so there's there's certainly a lot of uh, there's a lot less miles being driven um around for for recce's and 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 just wasteful trips because there are a lot more zooms but i think on the backhand of that doubling the crew sizes and just the actual facilitation you know our trailers you try and find a trailer you can't find a dining bus because before you would have one dining bus now you've got four because not only have you got to social distance dining buses you also have to pod your dining buses so 
that's a lot of emissions just driving around with trucks. So there are some pros, but there are certainly a lot of cons too. Um, and I think what has happened, and I'm starting to see happen now, is we started out like this. This is what we have to do, and everyone needs to be safe. And there, there is naturally a balance starting to be found within, within shows. As people start to grasp the concept of what we need to do, we find ourselves going back to a lot of the old fashioned methods, whereas, you know, um, we're using in the summer times, you know, more easy ups and outside tables, the location crew or the unit crew will carry around, which for some time has not been acceptable because, you know, it's not as nice as a dining bus, but we are finding that we have to adapt because there really isn't anything available. But two, we have to sort of go back and do things traditionally because that's what's really safe. So. There are, there's a lot of fat I found being cut naturally. Um, jobs last year, it was easy to change the whole setup for tomorrow and, you know, order a new crane for the next day and get six grips in. You can't do that now because of testing, because the cranes are not available, because the entire crew would have to change because of COVID. So there's, I'm finding there's less waste in terms of what's on paper your scenes are pretty set so that's quite nice but there is a lot more waste in terms of extra bodies in order to achieve this calmness there's quite a lot of madness behind the scenes yeah completely and what about some of the other key issues facing productions at the moment i mean in things like insurance uh obviously we talked about protocols choosing locations financing as well is obviously another key point um, Mike, yeah, do you want to come in with some of these sort of issues? And obviously, when you have conversations with producers looking to shoot in Spain, what are some of the issues they they ask you about? Yeah, thanks, Chris. <clears throat> um, well, I think strategically, to, to, to Mike's point earlier, uh, one of the challenges is, is of course, the, 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 the hugely accelerating and, and continue to, continue to accelerate demand for high end content, particularly in the drama space, uh, means that views are stretched. Um, I think, you know, one can't kind of create apprentices fast enough to fill the, uh, uh, to fill the void. And so part of our responsibility is to, is to very carefully consider the, the, the demands and requirements of the show. And can we staff accordingly? So strategically, obviously as a company, we want to try and attract and retain the best talent, uh, across our filmmaking community within, within Palmer Pictures. Um, but also, you know, there's been discussion that perhaps, um, there's a greater amount of, of time for, for, for prep and for wrap and for consideration. We see that to an extent, but then also don't see that uh, to an extent as well, because, because the, our screens have been, let's say, void of new content for a little while. I'm overstating it because production hasn't been able to, to really keep up in, in over the past year. And so everyone was kind of uh, starting at the same time. Uh, and we have to have some quite robust and honest conversations with, uh, with our producing clients sometimes who may have a, a tighter schedule than, than, than we would like to work to. And ultimately people come to us and hire us for our advice. Um, and sometimes, um, that advice, uh, is, it's not the, in the right kind of way, it's not the most welcome because we're having to put a, put, put brakes on something and say, okay, we don't think that you honestly have enough prep time to, 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 to shoot this or you know, or, or, you know, um, uh, you know, different areas or, or different monies allocated to, 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 you know, uh, to Jeff's point about, uh, uh, social distancing or facility vehicles, or, you know, uh, one of the, uh, uh, we had a recommendation re uh, recently where everyone needs to, uh, from a COVID standpoint, uh, self-drive, uh, I get that of course, socially distanced and stuff, but then poor location managers <laughs> like Mike and Georgette suddenly have five times the amount of vehicles to park at the unit base. How does that work? Is that sustainable? Not particularly. So I think that from a sustainability perspective, um, there will be, uh, it will be worse. I think we're all probably greener, uh, uh, uh minded, you know, we've, we've had a, as a company, we've had a, an MS European certification for the last 11 years. So we're very focused on, on, on our environmental credentials, but in the short term, single use, uh, you know, masks and, and, and dining sets and, and et cetera, et cetera, uh, is not sustainable. Uh, but I hopefully it'll, it'll kind of auto correct back to, uh, to a better point than we were, uh, pre COVID. About the issue of insurance, particularly COVID insurance, has that changed in the last year or so? I mean, Sam, I know we talked about this about a year ago, 
has the situation improved? Is it a lot easier now to get the insurance you need to be able to continue with production the way you want to? Well, there is now the government-backed scheme that uh, allows um, films to register with them for ins the purposes yeah. of insurance, the government yeah. schemes, and also individual studios are providing their own coverage in some instances. Um, it's still fraught with problems, as I say. I've, I've had a, a number of shows that have tried to get up and above, but they just can't make it. So it's still a struggle. Uh, and again, how long? I don't know how long it will be a struggle for. Um, but as uh, Mike's already said, that we're a very resourceful bunch of people, and we'll make, if we can make it happen, it will happen. Um, and it's just a different way of thinking about things and adapting and changing as we go forward. Uh, which is the main thing and allowing everyone to take on board what we've already had and what we're going to have to do in order to get our productions made and has been shown that the great wrath productions coming out now that shows a testament to the filmmaker that they can get on board and make things look as normal as possible and i was just watching one of your uh, the first uh, meeting this morning that people are fed up with uh programs about contagion about pandemics about blah, blah. we want to there's a new world in which we want to have stuff that really starts we're all back almost starting from uh, scratch in exploring our world again and there's this desire for everyone to explore and get out there even though at the moment we can't so um yeah it's, it's a difficult a difficult time that will hopefully in the next six months will address itself and will become uh, a lot clearer i hope going forward yeah, likewise. Uh, Mike F, what about the situation in the US with insurance? Is, is that sort of resolved itself or is it still quite difficult? Does it depend on the state you're filming in or? I think you know, I don't really deal with insurance very much other than for locations. But from what I'm hearing from folks at other studios, the majors aren't having a problem. The major studios um, are just fine, as was alluded to. Um, it's the small companies, the independents, the folks trying to make a movie for $7 million who are having a struggle with, with, uh, with, with insurance. Okay. I also touched on um, financial incentives as well. I mean, how, how important are they still? I know obviously in Spain, for example, Mike, you've got some fantastic incentives there. Is that still high on the list of uh, priorities for producers coming to shoot in the country? Oh, very high. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it tends to be so the, the, the kind of you know the three topics of immediate conversation number one is covid obviously at the moment still uh, uh number two is you know i'd say it's still led by the creative you know might spain work as a backdrop for the scripted material uh, if it doesn't uh, we're not having the, you know, the conversation doesn't doesn't progress from there uh generally our clients and producers and, and folks like mike and, and georgette and, and sam are very well educated and so they'll know so if they're having a conversation with us and they're pointing the compass at spain generally they have a very good understanding of whether spain will work as a backdrop anyway so <clears throat> and then and then typically uh, coming in coming in closely after that is you know how does it work economically financially and, and rebate is 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 very much a big ticket in 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 that conversation um you know to your point spain you know uh, 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 thankfully even though even though we're kind of in the starting stages of COVID. Um, uh, the Spanish government boosted the incentives considerably last year, so in May 20, 2020, which uh, which we're we're grateful for. You know, certainly makes uh, Spain an, uh, an even more attractive destination. But uh, yeah, it's right up there in, in terms of uh, of conversation for sure. And Georgia, we've talked a bit about obviously location management, but how has it changed in the last sort of few months? Are decisions about where to shoot changing on a regular basis still? depending on the situation in the country or state or region? Um, no, actually, the prep work, as we were saying, getting in early, it's that is still still constant. I think what is changing is when when you're going to shoot these things. So there was this one job that I was working on was shooting in Italy, um, and that just kept getting pushed because you're constantly watching the data and the numbers, and if infection cases are going up, you can judge that in 16 weeks they may be on the way down. But with... It's a, a lot of a guessing game with the, you know, the Amber system and the visas and the anyone else shooting in the area and also when you can take your crew and the infection rate. So they all factor in and there are a lot of people much more intelligent than I watching the data and watching all of those things. One of the things that 
has become quite constant in the scouts that I'm looking at is um, just reliable places. So Spain has had a tax incentive set up for quite some time. When you go to a country with a tax break, one of the first things you would normally do is look to make sure that they've got the crews because with a tax incentive usually comes established crews. With a new tax break, that's not always the truth because you're training people. So what's happening now is that I've been, I'm looking at a lot of reliable places where we have shot before because I think with COVID, COVID and the added pressures that that brings, people really don't want to be having other issues as well, like, you know, fundamental, can't get the equipment in, trucks not turning up, people just not understanding the importance and the time pressures of filming. So I think that we will really see our close relationships nurtured in the next few months when these uh, travel sanctions get, get sorted, just because it's about going where you know you can trust. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, extending from that is a good question that's come through. Um, would you say that rushed production with very tight deadlines where thousands of creative decisions need to be made very rapidly have a tendency to paradoxically actually create great content? Um, Sam, do you want to start? And then Mike, do you want to come in after? Decisions on the hoof are a thing of the past. I don't think uh, forward planning is now the order of the day. And I don't really see how we can we can do stuff on the hoof, certainly for the next six months. Um, and it, does that, I mean, the more you talk about stuff, to, uh, creative decisions are often made on the, on the cuff, as you say. And I think, yeah, does it, it's a different way of thinking for us. Uh, and I think we adapt to it. Does it, does it help or not? I'm not, I don't know. I, I would like to think it doesn't because we've adapted to it. Um, I'd love to, the spontaneity of filmmaking is what makes it so joyous. Uh, and having it squashed out of you because you have to plan so far in advance um, is is difficult. It's manageable, but it would be nice to get back to that world. But then saying that by not by having it planned out financially, it's a lot. It's a better model to go forward on because at least you know where you are. Um, when you make stuff up as you go along on the day, it's that's where it tends to start to becoming very expensive. So it's pluses and minuses. There's always going to be winners and losers. Inevitably. Mike, uh, did you want to add to that? Sorry. A, a quick decision today <laughs> is not a quick decision, you know, from two years ago. Uh, we've got to figure out where we're going to run for cover in a couple of days. And, you know, in the old days, we decide the morning before or maybe at noon time. Today, we've got to factor in a couple extra days. So we've got a whole cover set schedule and we're prepping five locations to be able to go to them at the drop of a hat, depending on the day and after availability, and all that stuff. And we, you know, we're, we're preparing now so that in a couple of days we can make a quick decision, but we're, pre we're preparing many more locations as opposed to just one or two for, for cover. Uh, yeah, spontaneity, uh, uh, it's defined differently today than it was, was a year ago. And there's just no way to say, we're gonna do this right now because there's so many factors that have to be considered before you can do almost anything. George, did you wanna quickly come in there as well or? Yeah, I'd just, I'd just like to say, you know, we're only cats for nine lives and what what we have to keep our lives for really is COVID cases. So the only, the only, you have weather cover. If it rains and you have to move inside, you've only got so many weather cover days. You also have to have COVID cover days. If you've got principle one and two in a scene and principle one test positive, you're changing everything to try and get 10 days worth of work pulled up. So there really isn't time to also have last minute creative changes. I think every department has suffered. Um, and I think that's the creative um, suffering is that all of those last minute changes that you wouldn't normally be able to do, you can't because you have to shoot what's scheduled just in case, you know, you need to save those lives for when your positive cases come, if they come and be able to move different work in different spaces. Fantastic. Mike Day, there's a question here for you. Um, how is Spain reacting to the potential future shortage in terms of production talent? Are there any new film schools, for example, being built? 
That's a good question. Um, <clears throat> I'm sure, uh, it, it, you know, to, to a great extent, um, uh, in the same way as probably other European and, and, and global neighbours. Um, you know, as, as a company, we have a very, um, very long established internship, apprenticeship, program we have uh, conveniums with local universities and so we're also I think we have a, a responsibility to help bring through the next generation of filmmakers and that's uh, an enjoyable part of, uh, of, of my job of our job um, nationally yes uh, there's, there's certainly you know it tends to it tends to be cause and effect doesn't it uh, you know, one sees that that there is a, a global boom in, in in production and content creation and it's a uh, it's an interesting job. It's a multifaceted job uh, uh, with with many different entry points, um, and I think uh, uh, quite attractive to a, uh, uh, to a to a number of, of young folks coming out of university or, or beyond. Um, I couldn't uh, I couldn't comment on whether there's a specific uh, new film school being built in 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 Valencia or, or Barcelona. I'm not sure of that, but I'm sure that there probably are. Yes. Fantastic. Uh, there's another good question come through. Uh, in fact, it's something you touched on, Sam, earlier. Has, has Brexit affected any visa issues going to European countries? Do you want to start on that one, Sam? Uh, it, it certainly affected it in the sense that we have to do it now, whereas obviously uh, uh, six months ago, we could just rock up at any, any of our European neighbours. And now, uh, not only does COVID present an issue uh, with the amber, with the traffic light system, um, but also the applying for visas um, and just touching on with Mike before we started this conversation there are work throughs on it but we're all still working through it uh, and I think the creative community moving backwards and forwards between countries whether that's a musician a filmmaker or a footballer or a sportsman uh, there are issues that we're overcoming and I think in time they'll become uh, it'll become easier but at the moment it is a struggle uh, certainly I know of foundation who were filming out of Ireland um, they found it very easy because they're still part of the EC moving into Spain. But then when you start to try and move an English crew into Spain, uh, I was on a production that actually relocated to the Dominican Republic because it was proving too difficult to move people from this country into the Canary Islands. Um, we're going to be there for a few more years uh, while we sort this out. And uh, uh, the, the, we used to do visas going abroad to, the, to, to Europe. I remember having to apply to a visa to go abroad pre EEC days. Um, and we're back there again. And I think in time it will change, but not at the moment. Mike, Dave, do you want to come in there? I'm interested to know your thoughts in terms of the impact of Brexit on, you know, in Spain, for example. Yeah, well, my old man was an Irishman, mm -hmm. so I'm going to quickly apply for Irish. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Um, no, it is challenging, and I think I think to, to Sam's point that the kind of the the perfect storm of of, of Brexit and COVID uh, throws up some challenges. Um, but we're you know we're, we're working around. We have we have some teams, uh, um, US UK teams in town at the moment. Uh, so we've been operating. Uh, uh, you know, UK is one of our principal markets, so we've been operating since. Uh, since Brexit, since kind of December 31, bringing people through. Um, it's a bit clunky in truth, um, but we're part of, so as Palmer Pictures, we're part of ProFilm, which is the uh, an association for the main international production service companies here in Spain. And we have, uh, we're a dog with a bone uh, in terms of having conversations with governments. Um, and, and they're aware that these things need to be uh, smooth. I think they will smooth, uh, I would hope, in the in the coming weeks, kind of couple of months, I, I would hope I'm an optimist at heart. Um, <clears throat> but also uh, uh, the Spanish government and the Pedro Sanchez recently uh, uh, launched the, the, the audio visual hub in Madrid to kind of great fanfare. Uh, and the industry was lobbied as to, or was asked as to what, uh, uh, what government could also do to smooth and attract production. And we went, we're, we're kind of fits service people and, and location managers we went down to the the grassroots of of fast track visa systems and the like because uh you know those are those are things that can affect production on a on, on, a, on a on a daily basis and also there's the there's the cost implications but i i do you know the optimist in me says that's a that's a short-term kind of bump in the road uh, and we'll solve that we're looking to solve that you know in, in daily conversations with government and and as i said you know we are we are getting people through here. It's just a little bit, uh, 
a little bit more time inefficient than we'd like. Coming down, impact of Brexit. Cool, Jack, can you hear me? Oh, I can, and you can out my name. In terms of Brexit, I'm not, um, I'm not seeing so much from a location perspective yet, but what I am seeing as a supplier is a massive drought, which is not COVID. I mean, I'm, I've got a supply company that we, we have run facilities and we've, you know, we do a lot of COVID supplies and location supplies. And it is, there really are consequently stuff coming out of Germany, stuff coming out of France, getting stuff into the country, Brexit and COVID. Um, there are some border treaties that, that are fine. You know, if you're coming in on a two day and turning around, you can come through the borders for France, but we're finding because of Brexit, there, there just isn't anything available. So not only are we very busy and taking a lot of stuff, with the restaurant, um, with the restaurants opening up and demand being high, plus demand supply chains being hit, there is a huge backlog of um, equipment, you know, from every sector, not here. And that just that small amount of Brexit delays is impacting a lot on on our, our facilitation. So that's that's having a direct front line a hit straight away. In terms of just visa and movement i really haven't i've been doing so much stuff with the us and the uk that we've obviously got visa issues there but i haven't been dealing a whole lot with the the visas in europe okay uh, there's another good question that's come through for all of you um are the panel expecting that as covid levels come down these restrictions will be lifted and things return closer to the old normal in 2022 there has to be an end point surely coming does the panel agree mike f do you want to come in there yeah, I think everyone, it's amazing to me for as quote unquote liberal a, a group as filmmakers are, they're being very conservative in with the protocols. I think at least from what I've seen, um, nobody wants to be that show that goes down because X number of people uh, came down with COVID. So I think it, it, it will, things will be relaxed, but it's going to take some time. I think 2022, unless we get some huge spikes this fall, I suspect that we'll be back close to normal. I don't think we're ever going to get back to normal. I know, you know, just talking to, to, to folks, some folks are always going to wear a mask when they go into a crowd, go to a concert, get on an airplane, uh, go to church, do whatever. Uh, I, I think some of these things will never go away for some folks. But um, it's uh, to me, it's next year sometime. Do you agree with that, Sam? Oh, we are we are a very conservative bunch, and I think we will. The protocols will stay in place for some time, even though all around us things are going to be relaxed. Uh, and there's still some debate whether in June in the UK whether things will be relaxed finally, um, as we all get. Uh, whipped up into another frenzy of what's the next variant coming along. Um, I can see an element of the way that we behave. The it's it's interesting hearing listening to people on the radio and the television talk about getting back to work, getting back to meeting friends, and the resistance from people who are going. Well, actually, you know, it's been a year now, and we actually quite enjoy it. It's quite, it's quite nice. I think work wise, we have to return to some form of normality. We can't continue doing this and. All the people that Georgette's employing at the moment and all the COVID teams will go back to doing their normal job. I certainly know that when we're trying to get a COVID team together, it's becoming very difficult because people are fed up with it and they want to go back to their proper jobs. And COVID is a can be a, a very sore point for some people because we just want to do, do our jobs properly. And COVID is a here today, gone tomorrow, but it won't be gone tomorrow. And I think there'll be some form of it here for maybe another year. Um, as, as we started off the host conversation, 2021 is getting back to uh, on our feet. 2022 is us really getting on with it. Mike, D, do you want to come in there as well? Yeah, sure. I think, um, <clears throat> you know, I, as I mentioned earlier, I am, I am an optimist. I think that in terms of, of, of workflows and, um, you know, incoming projects into our collective kind of pipelines onto our collective horizon. I think 2022 will be very much a rebound year. I think there's lots of 
lots of lots of great shows that will be made over the course of the year perhaps close to to, to 2019 levels if not maybe even even beyond because of the <coughs> has been, uh, suggest it was uh, um i think it'll take some considerable time for covid to be to be firmly in the rear view mirror um i think it, it will be with us I'm, I'm i'm not a medical expert and far from it uh but i think that we will be living in a covid environment working in a covid environment for for considerable time to come actually um but we we will have learned how to we are learning we have learned to an extent we'll have learned how to to operate within that environment safely um and i think we kind of have to grasp the nettle and get that really completely uh georgette do you want to also add something um, so one of the one of the doctors that I work with said that you know years ago you could just go for an airport and then 9/11 happened and now all these years later we're still taking our shoes off at an airport um, mask wearing it's very much thought amongst the epidemiologists will still be here for at least you know the next five years there will be people that won't go into a bank without wearing a mask there are people that it's changed there's a lot of um, optimism about being normal again when i think actually this is the new normal it's just about where we find our balance and i think if you take that approach to it then you can't be let down because what we've seen is you know the first lockdown everybody thought we wouldn't lock down again we just we don't know but for now we're trying to establish a balance and i think mentally we need to know that we are going to come out different and not like this because it's not sustainable but i do feel like we're going to be here for some time slowly gaining ground but still um still having to make quite a few sacrifices uh to to keep people safe i agree uh, final question then um it comes from uh, candace saying what advice do you have for people trying to get experience and enter into the industry in the time of covid uh when there are such strict limits on the number of people that can be on set and obviously in a very different environment to how it was a year ago uh, Mike Day, do you want to come in and start that? Sure. Um, I always say to, to folks uh, to be determined, it sounds obvious, but, but be determined, uh, uh, do your research, uh, be passionate uh, and, and try and um, speak to as many folks as possible so you, you, you understand uh, which angle you should look to enter the industry from. It's such a broad such a broad working environment film and television you know whether you're a location manager or a props master or a cinematographer or an editor or it's just so very broad um but i think that perhaps i think it is probably restrictive because because of the uh, the, the, the the covid environment but we have as i mentioned earlier we have a, a kind of significant kind of internship program and apprenticeship program and uh, we, we've been taking on the same uh, numbers of people uh, and I feel desperately sorry for them, but a lot of them are having to work remotely. Uh, and so, you know, whereas they would come to Spain and spend time in our studios and spend time on our sets uh, from, from London or, or Amsterdam or another Spanish city, uh, we're having to work hard to try and coach them through. But also the responsibility, I think, falls to us as employers as well um, to try and help those young folks who are, who are stuck in a, in a single bedroom kind of uh, in a... In a, in a yeah. Uh, in, a, in a university town somewhere, and, and try and help them, try, try and help onboard them, and give them the right set of set of skills. And so we are all having to change our working practices and working from home, and and communicating uh, more more regularly and more um, uh, uh, more kind of incisively with our remote teams. And I think the same goes for, for young folks entering the industry. I think the numbers are down on set, but I think it falls to us to to give them a helping hand, really. Yeah, because I mean, having a skilled crew is, is so important, but obviously heavily affected by COVID, isn't it, Georgette? This must be a difficult time for those that are trying to break into the industry. Um, well, in a COVID department, we recruit from everywhere because nobody wants to do it. <laughs> so <laughs> if anyone fancies working in COVID, please apply. Um, but we are, I found that I've taken a lot of people from the event sector. Uh, all I would say to anybody that's looking to work, nothing you do right now is invaluable. COVID has like leveled the playing field. Why a lot of people couldn't work, you know, bus drivers, nurses, supermarket workers held up our countries and it really has made it, um, those transferable skills are welcome in our industry. Every department has to embrace COVID. Every department has to use those skills that they've learned in an outside world. 
and apply it to what they do. So on an internship, any sort of jobs that you can do that help with your common sense and you know cleaning and all of those things that you may not feel are working towards your goal, they are. And I, I stress to anybody, put that on your CV because one of the things I look for are all those jobs like bar work and things that people have done because it gives you you know such a sense of, uh, of having to do those jobs that you don't want to do and so it makes you value what you're doing so i would say make sure that all of that goes onto your cv and look on facebook there's lots of groups there's lots of recruiting training the lmgi there are lots of training platforms so really look at what department you want to enter into but in the meantime anything you can be doing screen skills have skills um certificates you can do that are free there's lots of stuff out there to do and we're out there so you know find us and send us your cvs and, and see what we can do because as we all keep saying our industry needs people and if we don't train we won't ever solve that so it is out there if you want to find it so like advice for those breaking the industry um again i echo what uh Georgette said that it's essential that we that we train the next generation and at these times it's difficult and we've already said there's no there's not enough crew out there we need to really encourage enable and make it possible for people to see how the industry works and bring them through um it is difficult but i would go the extra mile to bring those new people in we really do need to to create a, a solid strong workforce going forward and as much as we turn around and say well, we can't have 50 people on set if we could just have a couple of those as trainees, then I think it's essential. It really is essential to train the the, the training regime, the training facilities have, sl have depleted over the last couple of years. And I think it's incumbent on all of us to encourage the next generation and make it possible for them, whether it be remote or as humanly practical on, on the actual job and see how the job works. It's important. Completely agree. Mike, do you want to finally make a point on that? <clears throat> sure. I agree with everything that everybody has said. Um, in spite of COVID, there's no better time to get into the business because of the huge demand for content. The one suggestion that I would have for anybody just breaking in is don't be too anxious to move up the ladder. Spend the appropriate amount of time to learn your craft. Uh, one of the things that I see and what, and what I'm dealing with and what a lot of my friends here are dealing with, and not just as location managers, but across the board and, and all of the, all the different jobs is folks are getting into the business and within two or three years, they're way higher than they should be. The, the, the days of the apprenticeship are gone, but, um, I've encouraged some people on my team, other folks looking for jobs, take your time, learn the craft, figure it out before you move up because your chance of success is much, much better if you take the time to really, really, really know your job. So. Fantastic. All right, well, listen, thank you so much uh, to you, the speakers, uh, and obviously you, the attendees, and our sponsors, Palmer Pictures, for this uh, excellent session. Yeah.